music. The Michael Deacon program. Is the embassy? Is the embassy? Is the embassy? and girls for another special edition of the Michael Deacon program. In a moment I'll be joined by Mr. Leo Zagami. He's a highly respected author and investigative journalist. You've heard him here and all over the place including Infowars with Alex Jones. Leo, how's it going my friend? Oh great, glad to introduce uh, your audience to another book. It has not been that long ago since we introduced volume 10 and today we are going to be introducing volume 11. I love that, yes. Uh, today we'll be discussing your latest book, Confessions of an Illuminati, volume 11, The Past, Present and Future of Mind Control from Sun Tzu to MK Ultra and Beyond. And I'm looking forward to having this discussion with you, my friend. Absolutely, and I think it's a topic which is also very important uh, today in this age uh, of uh, widespread mental illness and confusion, uh, propaganda and psyops uh, conducted uh, indiscriminately against uh, even the U.S. population. I think it's definitely a topic of importance. It really is, and first I'd like to say congrats on the new book. I suspect many people will be interested in it. And the MK Ultra project is a topic I'm particularly interested in. Psychological warfare has been used for centuries to defile your enemies, and it is still currently being used today in various forms. Absolutely, but here we make a distinction between MK Ultra and psychological operations because this book gives you a timeline, an exact timeline of mind control, and goes also beyond MK Ultra because formerly MK Ultra, as you know, ended in 1973. But uh, the history of mind control has, uh, we can say, ha had just started in the modern era. And uh, I think that the uh, Pandora's box opened by the experiments of MK Ultra uh, are very important and relevant to this day, for sure. But we also have other kind of uh, other forms of mind control which have been elaborated since the end of the 70s, early 80s, uh, and uh, those that eventually will take uh, the form in 1980 of. Uh, um, of a new kind of uh, mind control that Michael Aquino, the late uh, Michael Aquino, oh, yes. who used to be an expert in psychological warfare, called Mind War. Uh, now, a lot of people are fixated. Uh, on, of course, Michael is a very controversial uh, figure. I used to know him personally, so I know very well. One is tempted to always focus on those kind of uh, connections with the satanic, uh, with oh, yeah. the esoteric. But in this case, uh, I'm focusing, of course, on uh, Aquino's uh, uh, professional proposals in the psychological warfare uh, department, let's say, in his uh, uh, work before and after he left, uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the, the forces, because at one point uh, in the early 2000s he left, but it was uh, at that point, actually, that many of his techniques that he had pioneered oh, yeah. uh, were uh, utilize, uh, utilized and uh, and today we have also uh, cognitive warfare which is also uh, a even more subtle but even more insidious form of mind control which is uh, exercised on the population so there's definitely a lot to discuss today and uh, for those who don't know me i'm leo zagami i am of course known as a investigative journalist and a writer but uh, uh, I was a member of the Monte Carlo Lodge of the P2, that's, for example, where I met Michael Aquino, even if we never met in person, we, we only had this uh, long relation as pen pals, let's say, we used to exchange a lot of ideas in subjects like mind control and also theosophy, because a lot of people forget that uh, uh, Michael Aquino's passion was theosophy, 
uh, more than Satanism, it, 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 when, uh, within, uh, let's say, his inner circle of uh, friends and acquaintances. Um, I'm also very interested in this topic because it touches me personally. My father, as you know, was Dr. Elio Zagami. Uh, he had uh, um, worked himself uh, uh, on uh, experiments that were conducted on behalf of MK Ultra in Paris during the 1960s. So I talk about that also in my new book. And for those who don't know me, I used to be a member of what, uh, of course, we commonly refer to as the Illuminati. And I was also uh, involved in several Masonic orders. Um, this book, I would say, is probably the less esoteric, but at the same time, it has elements that are very important for the initiatic world. Because for the first time, I also talk about the psychology, the psychology of initiations, of how the Illuminati, the Freemasons uh, in certain lodges uh, um, that are controlled by people who are more unscrupulous and, uh, and, and let's say of, of the average Freemason from your social kind of uh, Masonic environment that tend to utilize these lodges to experiment forms of mind control. Um, so this book uh, actually explains for the first time the psychology of initiations that regards of course, the Illuminati, Freemasons, but also many other uh, kind of so secret societies, actually also college fraternities, which are not uh, per se uh, very secret, but the rituals, as we know, are very controversial, uh, the hazing, the, the, the way uh, initiations work, are made to actually uh, forge uh, the, 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 the initiate in some way. At times, they go one one step too far way too becomes, far yes and it becomes uh, traumatic but that's why in this book i wanted to really talk about also the initiation uh, aspect and how they keep the illuminati into check for example and that's something i think that a lot of people will be very curious to learn because yes i talk of course about the psychological warfare mind control experiments and all the rest exercise on the masses on the on the majority of us at times uh, uh, these experiments have been conducted without, without our knowledge, of course, unknowingly. Other times they were volunteers and they were experiments that were conducted also in regards to initiations. Uh, and, and so for the first time I wanted to explain what, uh, let's say, the craft of initiation and the way they manage to then control the adept and make them do whatever they want. And you mentioned a whole lot of things there that I want to touch upon, but you mentioned uh, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino, who I had a pretty decent friendship with. He's been on the program for many, uh, well, he was on the program for many years until he passed. And, you know, a lot of people, they find this program through looking for Michael Aquino and they'll find our interviews. And I get heat all the time, meaning I, I get, I get some people out there that get really angry with me in general for well, listen, having him on the program. I mean, uh, <laughs> you see, I have even published in my latest book uh, a one of the many mails that he exchanged in, in, in regards to the participation mm -hmm. of a meeting we were organizing in Monaco, in the Principality of Monaco. And he himself describes, uh, describes uh, you know, uh, basically Aquino describes himself as a Norwegian. Uh, he was uh, somebody who was trying uh, to bypass the rules uh, that up until 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago, were very strict also in regards to psychological operation to the United States population. Because that's, that's something that not many people know about, but the United States uh, is uh, maybe was, still is to a certain extent, let's say, the only place where um, psychological operations were prohibited on the, the population. You see, uh, it never really worked out uh, uh, benefiting the whole of the population uh, all the time, this whole thing, because they always found uh, other ways to uh, you know, go around this, uh, this law. Eventually, though, they will uh, 
change or at least try to change this law with Obama. There was the Smith Munt Modernization Act of 2012 that then w- was enforced the, the following year uh, and, uh, by Obama. And, and this, uh, this Modernization Act on a law that prohibited since 1948 uh, um, efforts of psychological operations within the United States, uh, it is, uh, I think, a sign of the times we are living because... Yeah. Uh, Today, unfortunately, because of people like Obama, uh, the, 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 the excuse that was given, just so um, maybe I can give a brief explanation to your audience. No problem. In, in 1948, uh, the U.S. Information and Education Exchange Act, uh, popularly called the smith Moon Act, was introduced um, and was introduced after the Second World War had proven that there were efforts by the Nazis, by the Soviet Union, to, in some way, uh, influence uh, the mind of the Americans. This uh, became, uh, I mean, in 1948, uh, Truman decided in general that he needed to pass this, uh, this law that was signed by him on January 27. And uh, this act was developed to regulate, so uh, the broadcasting, like for example, we have uh, in Europe, in the period immediately after the Second World War, Voice of America and all the brainwashing that was, uh, of course, conducted, uh, a counter brainwashing, because at that point uh, in Germany, you had to reprogram a whole nation that was completely lost with Adolf Hitler and Nazism. So there were very strict rules that that kind of propaganda couldn't be used within the United States. So that started to shape the future of the psychological operations because uh, um, the, th- th- that meant that within NATO, which then, of course, came into existence, and NATO uh, is an alliance that, as you know, today has 31 states, it was formed in 1949, but from the moment onwards, we were the only country which will not sigh up our own people. At least that was the common knowledge that we all had uh, within and outside the uh, armed forces. Then um, something, like I said, changed because now with the arrival of the internet, is much more difficult, first of all, to stop the foreign attempts to brainwash uh, the United States population, because they can, of course, you know, use social networks, they can use other pervasive forms uh, through the Internet that were not available before. So it's very difficult also to... And then at the same time, uh, we had uh, the, the excuse they used in 2012 was basically that Al Qaeda, ISIS uh, were trying to infiltrate the minds of the Arab population residing here in the US and they needed to counteract that. So they needed to eliminate that block on PSYOPs that we had here in the United States. That might seem like a good idea, but in reality, it opens the possibility to a wide variety of abuses that can be inflicted on the U.S. population from that moment onwards. So uh, because of uh, a PSYOP conducted on a couple of journalists from USA Today, this whole thing kind of went out of hand uh, because they, of course, then denounced what was happening and because it was happening within the United States. And uh, now there is still an ongoing debate on this uh, smith munt Modernization Act. However, it, like I said, it was established uh, after World War II purposely both out of the states for the extreme domestic propaganda of fascist powers and Soviet powers, and because of misgivings of, about American domestic propaganda, even in World War I, so not only World War II. So, the rest of NATO, though, didn't have uh, this law. And uh, when the, um, the infamous, uh, because it's really, you know, the, the whole Iraq, uh, uranium, uh, weapon of mass destruction, uh, rubbish, that, uh, that kind of, 
the whole story that basically brought us into Iraq. Oh yes, never forget Operation Iraqi Freedom. That is, that is also something we could de debate uh, because, of course, they use a lot of techniques that, uh, like I said, were established by Michael Aguino. Oh, yes, Michael, the, Michael, the godfather of propaganda. Yeah, the godfather of mm -hmm. But Michael Aguino, uh, like I said, uh, uh, of course, he might have been involved in the Presidio case, and definitely he was a weirdo number one, a spooky guy. I don't deny that at all. I, I, uh, he, I, I even told him to his face that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, yes. So, I mean, he, 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 he was disliked even amongst uh, intelligence circles at times. Um, but, how, however, he had this capacity of wanting to reform something from the end, let's say, of the 70s onwards, him and then, of course, also Colonel uh, John Alexander, mm. uh, Stubeldine. I mean, these are people that, as you know, then inspired the, 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 the famous movie with uh, George Clooney, the, the man who stares at goats and That's the whole right. thing, you know. But this is, uh, uh, what happened in the 70s was uh, like, Aquino disliked MK Ultra, disliked experiments which were too invasive. Dislike the fact that during the 20 years of MK Ultra, they had been, I mean, we know only about one death, the death of Frank Olson in 1953, which was right at the beginning of the whole experimentation, by the way. Uh, uh, but the, there were a lot of victims. We know, of, uh, of course, all the problems with uh, Dr. Cameron uh, uh, in, in Canada. We know about uh, other experiments that were conducted in Fort D Dietrich. But then, of course, we also know about Operation Midnight Climax, uh, which brought uh, uh, MK Ultra from uh, being a strictly volunteer-only kind of experimentation, which was done on volunteers within the armed forces mainly. And this actually at one point involved uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, which uh, of course uh, nowadays when we see what happened with, uh, uh, with uh, recently with the attempted assassination of Donald J. Trump, ah, yes. uh, you know, we see there is something really sinister about all these uh, lone gunmen because none of the families of, uh, I don't know, the family of Bob Kennedy or Martin Luther King or JFK ever believed the long gun theory. None of them. Right. And, and, and this book, uh, for the first time, wants, you, wants to put some clarity. Uh, that's why I, I, I really uh, suggest, of course, uh, everybody to read this book, which is, by the way, not such a big book that we have to. We also are selling it at very affordable. We, we made a sale, so make people avail easily available this book at fifteen ninety nine, which I find a very reasonable price for a book. Oh, I agree. And uh, by the way, you, you mentioned these assassinations, or an assassination attempt, rather, and. Uh, well, just, let's not forget the interpretation, the correct interpretation right. of the acronym is manufacturing killers utilizing lethal tradecraft requiring assassination. This is MK Ultra. Uh, you see, MK Ultra, uh, and I explained this in my book, uh, tends to become in the internet era a sort of urban legend slash myth slash uh, fantasy uh, because uh, uh, they mix up a lot of things. They, they, you know, ah, that singer, oh, he's MK Ultra. This other guy. Right. Is MK. In reality, formally, MK Ultra finishes in 1973. So we need to be a little bit correct about things because, as you know, I base my books on documents, facts. Right, and as you said, they claimed it disbanded in 1973. And, you know, these experiments were outright insane. And most of the recorded documents were destroyed. And I always found that yes. most, the most telling. How, how many times have we read that in various news stories that the evidence is always destroyed or lost from? Well, you see, they use it. Mm -hmm. Here there is a, a very interesting uh, thing that happened because they used the general panic that, at that in that moment, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the whole Nixon Watergate scandal oh, yes. created within the intelligence community. So at that point, the actual uh, head of the CIA had the perfect excuse to say, oh, we need to, 
to get rid of all of this. I, I mean, so people will say, but what is the connection between Watergate and MK Ultra? And, and and people will will ask me this for years, and you know, and I and I and I had to think a little bit about this connection until you know, uh, when I when I seriously uh, started uh, uh, a few years ago to think about doing a book like this, uh, um, I encountered a figure, a figure that uh, was involved with MK Ultra, but was also involved with the Watergate scandal. He was one of the main witnesses there, Everett yes. Howard Hunt. Uh, Junior. He was the super spy, the manipulator that was behind, of course, a lot of operations, uh, infamous operations. He testimonied, of course, for the Watergate scandal, but he also wrote, using another name in 1967, a book that is almost impossible to find. Impossible. It's called We Were Controlled. Oh. And the author of this book is Lincoln Lawrence, which uh, sources that are credible say it's Everett Howard Hunt. Now, why is so important this book? Because this book gives you details that nobody knew in 1967 when this book came out. You see, everybody now knows MK Ultra and it's so popular and ended up in comedy movies or uh, uh, songs or <laughs> I don't know even uh, comic strips everywhere right MK, MK Ultra now is pop but in 1967 nobody knew anything and what is written in this book uh, which I cite of course because it's almost impossible to find so I thought that this is an excellent opportunity also to introduce people to this piece of knowledge which is very detailed about the experiments that were conducted on the minds of people, but also the first implants. And, uh, of course, we need to always understand that when there is the CIA involved in the making of a book, Mm. it's not going to be completely honest. It's going to be partisan, and most of the times, they're always going to blame the Russians. Or the Chinese, but mostly the Russians. <laughs> right, they they like to blame the Russians for everything. It's it's always this this this. Uh, now um, is is interesting because I started this book uh, on mind control by talking about uh, Ivan uh, Pavlov. Uh, Pavlov is a pioneer, let's say. A, pi- a real pioneer. I mean, no, let's say. I mean, he's a real pioneer. In fact, Vladimir uh, Lenin. Vladimir Lenin went to uh, went to Pavlov immediately after he raised to power with the, the Soviet Union and asked him to work with him. You see. You know the famous movie, The Manchurian Candidate, the original one, oh, the yes. 1962, which, by the way, was censored for 20 years, the, the year after when Kennedy was assassinated. I mean, it's it kind of like the, the paradox was that Kennedy gave the permit, the, the permission for that movie, but the moment in which JFK gets assassinated, that movie, of course, uh, it becomes a little bit... Um, how can we say, uh, a not convenient movie to have a circle. <laughs> yes. So for 20 years, that movie was completely banned. Now, in this movie, the long shadow of Pavlov is actually involved uh, in, in, in the movie because we see Sergeant Raymond Shah, who is ordered to murder one of his fellow prisoners. And, uh, of course, here we're talking about uh, the two main characters of this movie, which are, uh, I mean, it is a great movie because I think it's very realistic. And it has also the involvement of people who were like Frank Sinatra, who for years tried to collaborate with the CIA. Um, And then we have, of course, the other protagonists of this movie, uh, which uh, it's it's, it's Lawrence Harvey. And... um, in this movie, like I said, you have the presence of Pavlov because at one point, when is uh, the, the evil Dr. Yen Lo, who is portrayed as this graduate of the USSR, Pavlov's Institute, explains to the rapt audience of communists 
we have, and this I'm quoting him, we have trained Americans to kill and then have no memory of having killed. The prisoner's brain has not only been washed, it has been dry cleaned. Now, after the Second World War, and with the beginning of the, what was uh, another big confrontation uh, for the United States in Korea, we have uh, a lot of paranoia, growing paranoia amongst the U.S. population that they might be brainwashed, that their soldiers abroad might be brainwashed, the POWs in particular might be brainwashed. Um, today, in 2024, the majority of the U.S. population is completely unaware of being controlled. Oh, yes. One instead, in the 1950s, they were warned about, about this. And so the film comes out in, in the heat of that warning that, you know, in the 1950s, people started to really fear brainwashing and mind control. And then eventually this movie comes out and we have this mention of the USSR Pavlov's Institute. Because, like I explained in my book, uh, Pavlov was consulted by Lenin, and he was uh, the one who started all these experiments uh, with the dogs. And then later on, of course, uh, once he started to work uh, with Lenin, he, he, he made him go into, uh, into the hospital so he could conduct the same experiments. Also, uh, the state-supported uh, lab, uh, of course, uh, was uh, much more rich at that point, and he could... Uh, take uh, humans instead than dogs <laughs> and, and as guinea pigs. Um, his, I mean, his, his techniques were very powerful, even if today, of course, uh, they, they can be regarded as primitive. They characterize the early stages of conditioning, and it is really thanks to, to Pavlov that we get all the way to MK Ultra, let's say. Yes, and they really shaped society uh, from film to uh, musical acts. In my opinion, I think the CIA was in control of a lot of things, including top musicians during that time. Um, a good example would be, in my opinion, The Grateful Dead. Yeah, yeah they gave them LSD. They wanted to slip LSD into Castro. So, no, yeah, these things we know. And yeah, they're definitely course, behind uh, the music industry, for sure. Definitely. And, and as you know, I made a whole book about oh, yes. Volume 8. So in, in this book, I focus more on the technical side of mind control. I mean, Love that. Uh, how Pavlov... Uh, uh, built his conditioning uh, without going into the, all the tedious details because of course uh, people can go and get the book but That's they, right, are, the book. They, they are described in detail so uh, it's about understanding uh, how mind control works, how it developed and how also it's different from I mean differences between mind control and brainwashing because right. there is a difference here and, and you see I would say that MK Ultra, for the large part, with all its various sub projects, of course, there is 169, some say 140, but I mean, there is a lot of them. So the sub projects are a lot, but uh, they were mostly brainwashing. And then, of course, they tried to start a relationship with the paranormal research which, however, would be conducted much later by people like John Alexander or Stablin within the military complex and the PSYOP operations rather than the MK Ultra experiments. Uh, though they started experiments also with uh, witchcraft or with all kinds of things with MK Ultra, they were going uh, basically around the US interviewing occultists and all this kind of. And of course, they saw. Uh, that uh, they could use people with a strong animal magnetism. Because let's not forget, uh, in my book, I explain how the Illuminati developed uh, with Franz Anton Mesmer what is known as uh, mesmerism and then hypnotism, which is a product for, I mean, how the Illuminati understand mesmerism, of animal magnetism. Eventually, of course, Michael Aquino will call it ele Homo Electromagneticus, and that will bring us to the future of mind control. But going back to the time of the Illuminati, Mesmer was known as this guy who could do things on you 
and will operate on you. He was a doctor, Mesmer. But then he had a competition from somebody who was not recognized as a doctor, who was Count Cagliostro, who was also a very powerful member of the Illuminati at the time uh, that precedes the French Revolution, and who was, of course, connected to Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin becomes very interested uh, with uh, the possibility of mind control. And actually, uh, he was Benjamin Franklin who said tricks and treachery are the practice of fools uh, uh, that don't have brains enough to be honest, uh, as well as uh, saying you can do anything you set your mind to. He was rumored to have, be, uh, to have investigated hypnotism and mind control on behalf of the early US government back in the early days of the of the nation. Um, so there was a lot of inter- interest. And then we have also Pascal Beverly Randolph, who is known, of course, widely as uh, the, the pioneer of sex magic, the first guy who established a Rosicrucian order here in the United States, and was very close to Abraham Lincoln. But Pascal Beverly Randolph was also an expert hypnotist, uh, in the sense that uh, they were starting to really study how to control people. But in the end, they understood. And I think, uh, I mean, Cagliostro, on the contrary of Mesmer, was more of a pure hypnotist. He didn't need all these kind of uh, weird machines, uh, you know, alchemical uh, things, external objects that he would use, let's say. Cagliostro used the power of the eyes, strict, like, you know, like one of those magicians that you can't resist with, you know, you, you oh, get spinning overwhelmed. Wheel. Yeah. No, you get overwhelmed by the, the power in, simply by watching their eyes. Now, to me, it happened only once in my life. I went in front of a person that had this kind of powers. Of course, his animal magnetism was very powerful, but also his eyes, their eyes. I mean, here we're talking about somebody that you don't want to be hypnotized and you start seeing that you are falling into hypnotism. That kind of strong, really, it's amazing because, I mean, I never saw it. Yeah. I never experimented. I went to Egypt and uh, we were in the middle of the night in Cancalilli, in this area where there is uh, this old, very old mosque and stuff. And my friend there said, Leo, in a moment, you will encounter this guy who is a little bit like the guard of Cancalilli. You have to pass him in order to go into the night into these mosques. Mm-hmm. And I said, uh, but what do you mean he's the guard? He says, listen. This guy works, I don't know, some say, you know, the Muslims say he works with genies. Uh, people from uh, from the Western world say he has an incredible hypnotic power. Just don't look him in the eyes uh-huh. when you pass. So I, I remember <laughs> I went to pass. Uh, I, was, uh, I was walking along and suddenly I see him. And he was a classic guy with a turban, you know, that you would say, oh, my God. But I was like, I didn't want to listen to my friend Paul. And I said, okay, I'm just going to turn and watch him in the eyes for a moment and see what happens. And I tell you, the moment I turn and watch him in the eyes, fortunately, I knew what I was doing. And I managed to then detach. But I felt the sense of like, suddenly being like, I didn't have any more control of myself. I was oh, wow. just just by watching him. Yeah. And it was just like, of course, I, I saw, you know, the stage hypnotist uh, doing this and that. But you have to understand that in the end, hypnotism on its own. And by the way, Leo, I hate to interrupt you, but how, how long ago was this uh, incident this, uh, here? Oh, this was in 2003, November, oh, okay. October, November 2003. I talk about, uh, by the way, that uh, period uh, of my life in volume 10 because it's connected to Islam, of course, and my research into the Cairo Lodge and all that. But um, he, he gave me kind of like a smile, like he let me off the hook almost, you know. And I saw that he, he, because he saw who, who I was with, I was with a member of the Butrus Galli family, so they knew, 
you know, he knew that I was with people who were. He very knew powerful. that you knew what was going on. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, so, but it was inter- I, I just w- that that feeling. That I feeling, know what you mean. Yes. I mean, it's like uh, you see, I, I was initiated. Uh, uh, in many secret societies, uh, see sex of the Illuminati network. And like I mm, described in my book, in volume 11, you are prohibited from being hypnotized. In, uh, in the OTO, when you get uh, basically uh, initiated in the OTO, you are, se- you are told, you are told that you are not to take uh, certain drugs and you are not to be hypnotized by anybody. So there is a specific, and this ritual, I mean, the the fact that- That sounds like no fun, Leo. No, no, but it was Alice (laughs) Crowley who devised it because he didn't want any of the members of the OTO, the Illuminati, to be brainwashed. Ah, So this is a specific request. So, um, you know, he didn't want anybody to have any post hypnotic or anything that could actually interfere with uh, with his control of the order. Because uh-huh. uh, when you have, uh, you know, when you are initiated uh, in, 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 in an order, you go also through certain symbols which have themselves an hypnotic power. And I, in this book, this is uh, the first book ever, I think, in uh, the English language, which also talks about uh, the experiments and the work of Stefano Benemeglio. Now, Stefano Benemeglio is still still alive and kicking, uh, on the contrary of Michael Aquino. And he's equally as dangerous, but much less known here in America, of course, outside of the, let's say, outside uh, of Italy is not very well known. But he is, uh, apart from being very... Um, a very respected psycho, you know, somebody who has dealt into experimental psychology, but uh, also he's a Satanist, a Satanist who has written in his own book on hypnosis dynamic, I call it dynamic hypnosis, the power, the hypnotic power of the symbols and the mantras that are recited during the Black Mass. So. Uh, in this new book of mine, I wanted to also include some of these uh, things which people have never really discussed because they don't know what goes on inside a black mass. No, of course not, yeah. Uh, and so, I've, I've, so you see, I think that in this book I give a lot of interesting inside details uh, about not only mind control for the masses, but mind control within these orders. Um, there is actually a whole testimony of the first time Stefano Benemeglio entered a black mass and how him as a mind controller who had uh, experience because he is very well known uh, in Italy. Uh, you can go and search him on the internet. Uh, Stefano Benemeglio is, 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 is like a very famous uh, academic, uh, but he's also a very spooky character. He has over 50 years he has been dedicated, he's a, psycholo- he's a psychologist, he's an hypnotist, he's a researcher, um, and he's, of course, a doctor. And uh, um, he has founded uh, an, um, a, uh, an, a discipline, a discipline of analogic sciences, he calls it, uh, and this uh, whole thing of uh, uh, hypnosis dynamic, dynamic hypnosis. And, 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 and so it's, I think it's, it's very important to uh, talk about this work because uh, me and uh, Michael Aquino often discuss uh, Benemeglio's activity, also because he's hardcore Satanist in Italy, like really hardcore. And he's still walking around. I mean, uh, his master, uh, Satanist, uh, uh, who is another guy who is in Rome, who was founded a group called Navona 2000, man, yeah, is actually a guy who, when Marilyn Manson comes in Italy, he sits on stage with him. Oh, wow. I mean, here we're talking about people who are really, really high up in the Satanic realm, but at the same time, also in the academic world. So Stefano Benemeglio was born in 1945. He's not that old. Uh, but he's still alive and kicking, unfortunately. <laughs> and, uh, he is uh, somebody who has uh, created this uh, uh, um, analogic communication, which is also something my father used to, uh, had been working on. 
My father has mainly been working, though, at the Sorbonne in Paris uh, with uh, um, experiments that uh, were on the use of LSD. And, of course, uh, they were directly connected to MK Ultra because they were reporting to people from uh, the CIA who were part of this. Uh, so he taught, he taught me a lot, my father, about, <laughs> about things. I was lucky enough, let's say, to learn a lot of Yeah, things. that's really interesting about your father and has these sort of things shaped your perception but about your father in any know, way. Yeah, people who don't know who mm -hmm. my father was. My oh, father yes, was a Dr. Elio Zagami. He was a young uh, psychanalyst. He was a doctor, a neurologist. I mean, he was a guy who um, had a career until the middle of the 70s uh, when uh, he, was, he became disgusted by the political abuse of psychiatry, by what the Tavistock Institute was doing, and he decided to give up all that uh, altogether. Um, especially after he had an accident with one of his clients, he went on holiday and this guy threw himself off the window. He said, okay, I had enough with this. Oh, wow. and he, he said at that point, I want to continue with my research but I want to do it out of the academic world because also once the, um, you see, the CIA had purchased, and I explain in this book, a certain amount of LSD from uh, the Sandals labs. Uh, once this uh, uh, LSD was finished, all the researchers working under the CIA, both in America and also abroad, because People don't know, but uh, there were man many clinics abroad also working, for, not only in Canada, also in Europe, in Norway, in France, in many countries working for the CA for Project uh, MKU. Once it was finished, my father was kind of like left with, he was like, I, I need to continue. Mm. He wanted to continue. He, because, see, my father's experiments were not of the coercive nature. It wasn't about doing the disgusting things Dr. Cameron did. It wasn't about self-diving or uh, putting people in rooms and uh, sleep deprivation and all kinds of... No, that wasn't what my father wanted to do. My father wanted to do what then later on John Alexander, Aquino and all those people did. He wanted to go into the realm of the paranormal slash uh, mind control interesting and he actually wrote a book uh, oh your dad did yes of course but this book then was forbidden because mm. i have a, a copy of it and, and and now finally thanks to my brother is is now selling because my father printed the first i think thousand copies okay then at two o'clock at night he received a phone call from a guy in the Italian intelligence who threatened him, said, Dr. Zagami, this is not a book you can bring out now. We advise you not to bring it out. Otherwise, some bad things will happen to you and your family. And at that point, my father never distributed that book. So we were left with thousands of co with a thousand copies <laughs> of this book uh, hanging around, you know, put in a thing. Interesting. And, and then, uh, you know, uh, after the death of my father, I started to sell these copies. Uh, and give them out also for free. I see. So I could spread it. It's only in Italian, of course. People ask me, oh, Leo, can we have this? Yeah. But, you know, but this book is only in Italian. And my father was really a good writer in Italian, but he never attempted to write in English because he could read English, he could read German. He was very good in German. Because my father had worked at the Institute, uh, at the Jung Institute in Switzerland, and Meyer who was the successor of Carl Gustav Jung, wanted to appoint him the successor. So he was very high up. But when he saw what the Tavistock Institute was doing, what the... Because, you see, when we talk about the political abuse of psychiatry, then we talk about, uh, immediately in the minds of the ignorant, uh, oh, yes, the Soviets, ooh, those bad Russians and their... No! No! It was done all over. It's still done today here in the Western world. Right. And that's one thing I was going to ask you, uh, Leo. I was going to mention, you know, they, they claim they disbanded all these sort of experiments. Um, but in your opinion, do you think they actually really did? You see, the experiments uh, uh, were continued and I list them uh, also after the closing of MK Ultra, but not within MK Ultra, not within the CA. The CA had, though, uh, 
produce some results with those experiments. And once you actually produce a result, uh, yes, they said, of course, all the documentation was destroyed. But still, to this day, from time to time, some of this documentation resurfaces because it's never all destroyed. But the thing is that those experiments produce some results. And so those results started to circulate also outside of the CIA in non-governmental agencies, cults, all kinds of other foreign intelligence operatives learned about them. There was also, as you know, a great competition between Russia and America. So it's not that suddenly in 1973, the Americans would simply stop everything because the public wasn't happy. Yes, of course, formally they had to stop everything. Otherwise, they will risk an amount of lawsuits that will never end. So they, 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 still to this day, we see the lawsuits also that were moved in Canada, where MK Ultra was conducted outside of U.S. soil, never really produced anything incredible. And Canada is one of the most brainwashed, actually, it is the brainwashed laboratory of the Western world. I define it this way in my book. Uh, is the place where during the pandemic they conducted the most incredible and shocking experiment on their own population. And this is confirmed by the Canadian armed forces. Not, I'm not in making it up. It's not the conspiracy theory. Like I said, I based my books on fact, not on fiction. And, uh, and, and, and what happened in Canada was that uh, not only they had uh, all the MK Ultra, of course, uh, but now, in more recent times, they had uh, a complete brainwashing, Chinese-style social engineering that is shocking when you think about this, the, the supposed Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Today, Canada is a mind control prison and a laboratory of the worst kind. And uh, it may never escape uh, this, neolib this uh, ne neoliberal hell, because like I explain in this book uh, with documents in my hands, there was uh, um, actually the Canadian Joint Operation Command that uh, started an investigation that had to stop what they were doing during the pandemic at one point. There was uh, a guy who was uh, called to... Uh, expect this whole thing, the now retired Major General Daniel Gosling, and uh, who, who was brought in to investigate in this whole scheme. And he concluded that the Canadian military commanders believed they didn't need approval from higher authorities to develop and proceed with their own brainwashing plan on the population during the pandemic. Wow, I didn't even know that. So this is a, it's a shocking uh, yeah, revelation wild. that uh, you can find in my new book, uh, because, I mean, I want to bring in this new book a timeline and also the latest events, because when we think about the pandemic, we are thinking also one of the biggest psychological operations ever conducted in the history of mankind. I agree. I agree. And again, just recently, we all watched a failed assassination attempt on former President Donald Trump. We witnessed history that day, and we nearly saw a man get decapitated in high definition on the world stage, and some people out there were cheering. Some people were highly disappointed that the shooter actually missed Leo. Um, I, I think that's pretty crazy that some people were... Well, it's crazy that people see to this day, the FBI says, uh, we don't know the reason for... for that's for the guy. other crazy but, thing, but, yeah. I mean, I mean they, they don't want to admit something because they're involved in this massive psyop against Trump to this day. You see, when you brainwash young people in the university and tell them to hate an individual called Donald J. Trump, and you do it 24-7 on your media. That is a psyop, okay? And, and it's disgusting what they're doing. But then there is something more about Thomas Crooks, because his parents were both people involved in mental health. And so it's much more complicated. And uh, um, But there is also... In the case of Thomas Crooks, I actually opened the book by stating people immediately, you know, a week after uh, the, the attempt at assassination, they are, ah, Thomas Crooks, uh, MK Ultra, MK Ultra. Guys, we need, to, when we discuss these kind of subjects, we need to be really detailed. That's why my book is number one in experimental psychology, in actually in academic circuits, they, they, they are 
dig in my book because I base my book on facts, not on wild speculations. And there is some facts regarding the attempted assassination of Donald J. Trump, which I discuss in my book, including the cremation of Thomas Crooks. Because, you see, we discussed just a moment ago, if you remember, Lee Harvey Oswald and the possibility that he had an implant. Um, this, imp- this, this is not just a wild possibility that he had an implant. There were experiments that are actually presented to, to us in that book, which I mentioned by, the, by Lincoln Lawrence, this, uh, which in reality was uh, Howard Hunt, which described the long history of uh, implants, which started a long time ago. And eventually, we arrived to the year 2024, where a week before the attempt at of Donald J. Trump, we have the announcement that you have a new mind control technology that is launched. Have you heard about this? Because this is the ultimate uh, revelation that will shock people. The nano magnetic genetic interface for neurodynamics, commonly now referred to as NanoMind, which is experimented at the Korean Institute of Basic Science. And this place announced their discovery just a week before the attempted assassination. Interesting. And this discovery proves that they localized in the mind of mice through nanoparticles Basically, with a switch now, they can make them do whatever they want. And that can happen also with a human being. Right. And, you know, we're seeing these sort of human trials going on with the Neuralink, thanks to Elon but Musk. That, but like I explained in my book, Neuralink, of course, you know, and I talk about computer computer mm-hmm. brain interfaces. But this neurodynamics is even more subtle and even more persuasive in if you want to produce a mind control assassin. It means that they have to destroy the evidence. And that's why Thomas Crook's body was cremated the 10 days after the attempted assassination. Right. It was just gone. Yeah. And, and, and once the body is gone, is cremated, you can't see if he was taking any drugs, any psychopharmaceutical compounds, anything. Because it was eliminated. Right. And that's a red flag for those that aren't paying attention. When things like that happen, like when a school was demolished right away, I'm Sandy Hook, and when Osama bin Laden was allegedly thrown into the sea, I mean, these are all just, these are all things that are bullshit, Leo. Yeah, and and, and up until now, of course, we have been talking about, uh, well, in the case of Thomas Matthew Crooks, is important to discuss him because he, right. he might have become... Uh, Another of uh, this uh, lone gun, <laughs> ah, <laughs> yes. you know. Like, and, uh, let, let's talk about this. I mean, uh, it, it, it's incredible how they 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 they, they want they think uh, that we are idiots. They really think we are idiots. I mean, if we go and see the similarities uh, with also the assassination of JFK, I mean, Lee Harvey Oswald uh, was probably not the only shooter. Maybe Thomas Crooks was not the only shooter. Probably but not. Probably but probably the, the fact is that we also don't need to focus on if it was or not a lonely shooter, because the main anomaly here is another. It's not the, the fact he was a lonely shooter or not. The fact that he had contacts with external sources is demonstrated even by a photo done a few minutes before the attempted assassination where he's watching his phone and he has encrypted apps that That's communicate right. with some... So while the the second shooter hypothesis might not be co- ever confirmed, uh, the fact that they are hiding uh, they're, other they're connections, hiding it, yes. it's, it's, it's obvious. Here. Very obvious. And, you know, things aren't truly encrypted, as they say. Nothing mm-hmm. is. No. So I, I don't buy I don't buy that excuse from uh, the feds. And going back to 1968 with RFK. That assassination, I, I also believe that was a direct result of yeah, mind no, control the, techniques, um, the, for the record. Yeah, no, 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 but you have to, to, I mean, when it comes to Siran, Siran, I mean, here we're talking about a low nut or we're talking about a, a mind control individual. When we're talking about Jam, James Her Early, uh, Her Ray, who is uh, the guy who, as they say, assassinated Martin Luther King, I mean, 
this is, like I said, this episodic revelation of the lone uh, nut syndrome seems to be almost common. Right. Uh, and so we have, uh, you know, if we carefully study these scenarios, what we will discover is astonishing. That's why I, I, I think that... Uh, this book brings you enough evidence without going to the second shooter theory. In fact, I say it in my book. We can, you know, the second shooter theory, there is even professionals like Dan Bongino, who used to be a former secret service, who is not a proponent, but even him says we have to look into other people that were probably with, uh, you know, behind Thomas Crooks. Because, right. you know, so even people who are quite critical about the second shooter hypothesis still seem to, and he is a professional, he has testimony, in fact, I think in front of Congress or a committee the other day. So, And, uh, and Leo, I hate yeah. to interrupt you, but what do you say of, about the fact that there are some people out there, a good majority of people out there, believe none of this was real, that it was all completely staged? What do you say uh, to that? I'm, I'm not interested in conspiracy theories. That's what I say. I say that uh, it's enough the fact that at the, uh, basically at the beginning of August, a congressman arrives in Butler, Pennsylvania, and suddenly they tell him that the body is cremated. That is a serious thing that should still be today on the newspaper in the newspapers, and nobody's discussing. I agree. I mean, we are talking about an event that took place exactly at the exact moment in which there was the cremation of her annual ritual. Now, we know the Bohemian Grove and the Bohemian Club have been for many years, you know, on the mouth of many conspiracy theories that, uh, and we know also Alex went inside, he filmed and all that. But maybe people don't know that within the Bohemian Grove, you usually have the creme de la creme of the military industrial complex in their own encampment, and you have also the husband of Nancy Pelosi. So I think that maybe people need to understand that it's not a coincidence that while they're doing the cremation of care ritual, somebody is attempting to kill the president of the United States, and at the same time, 10 days exactly 10 days after that he himself is cremated yeah that's no accident no it's, it's not it's, it's not a coin there is no coincidences in this kind of of things and so it, it, i think that it's quite incredible that even in the alternative media they have not really given enough interest to this synchronicity of events that was taking place. But if, like I said, when you have studied uh, and you have actually, I was actually guested by a high priest of the Bohemian uh, Grove, who is in the Bohemian Club, uh, John Compact, uh, and actually talk about in volume one of my confessions. Uh, and like I said, in these camps, uh, there is the creme de la creme of the various, you know, you have uh, uh, various people. They are divided into various encampments. And then you have various gathering places also that are part of the Bohemian uh, Grove setup. And one of the most important uh, is the one dedicated to the military industrial complex. So... Is it a coincidence that that day there was the whole military industry, which, by the way, NATO himself, NATO itself, and this is another big subject which I touch in my book, because I talk about cognitive warfare, uh, and I talk about uh, how uh, NATO operates in the realm of psychological operations, and NATO, you see, has always been also the perfect when they needed to bypass, because here in the U.S., even if we have the reform of the act we talked about at the beginning of the interview, if a U.S. citizen, had, you know, finds evidence he's under attack or a psychological operation, he could report that and he could actually have a, a good case for himself. 
Instead, like he said, the other NATO countries can't. So when it came, like I said before, to the weapons of mass destruction, they couldn't find them with the testimony from America. The PSYOP was created by the Italian intelligence, who then passed on the information. And then you had all those lying uh, neocons that in front of the United Nations said, oh, we have the evidence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq by Saddam Hussein. But that was a PSYOP. It was a PSYOP. And George but, Bush, but by the had, way. But because everything is built on plausible deniability, they could say, oh, yes, but the PSYOP was the Italians. It wasn't the Americans. All right. And for, for those that forgot... Uh, George Bush went on a rampage trying to incite an invasion of Iraq just hours after his inauguration, by the way, in, in 2000, that was back in 2001. And for those that forgot, you know, Dick Cheney also falsely stated that Saddam Hussein, he said Saddam Hussein, no doubt, no doubt, <laughs> has weapons of mass destruction. And my God, you know, that was a lie. Absolutely. It was not a lie. It was a psyop. Or a See, psyop, there, yes. There is actually a difference here because That's sometimes, true. you know, I mean, we tend You're to right say, oh, well, uh, he's saying a lie. No, no, he's actually exercising a psyop. Now, like I said, um, psyops should not be inflicted on U.S. population because it's the only country in the world that devised a legal... Um, and, and, and still to this day, even with the, the Modernization Act uh, of 2012, it's not a complete rebuttal, you know, of, of the old law. It's actually an amendment of it. So we can still operate with, uh, legally within those frames. That's why in my book I say it's still debated, the question, because uh, people tend to say, oh, um, yeah, Leo, but now with the, the uh, Modernization Act of 2012, uh, basically all Americans are open to psychological warfare. Well, uh, it's not that simple. It's not that simple. If you know your rights and if you have a good knowledge of the law, you can actually still sue their asses if they try to yeah. inflict the psyop. And a good lawyer, by the way. They, that's why... They became very scared when uh, those two journalists from America sued the American um, you know, because of that. I mean, it was like a very scary thing for them. You know, we are not right. talking about, we're talking about USA Today. I mean, it's like, it's, it's a tool of the propaganda itself. So. Big time. And Leo, let me ask you this. I, I know you mentioned your father here earlier, yeah. and I was going to ask you, in terms of his involvement with MK Ultra and some of the things that he may or may not did, did that uh, affect your relationship at all with him in any way, in any sort of way? Did you view him in a different light after figuring things out, or did you view him? No, no, no. no. He was very open about it. He was very no, open. No, okay. No, he, no, 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 no secrets. No. He was completely honest with everything with you, in no, other words. Look, my father, at one point, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I grew up and I, you know, but even when I was growing up, I saw certain things. And at one point, I also I saw he was not working any longer. Because he stopped in 1975, I was five years old, and he continued in private his uh, experiments. And I was brought, I remember, um, in the early 70s or the second part of the 70s, still, I used to go around with him in search of LSD. Oh, my. So, I mean, he Good would bring, you know, I was, no, not that I would take LSD myself, but I, I took LSD later on. And Good when times, I took too. LSD, well, good times. Absolutely. It was, it was something experimental. I took it very seriously. My father yeah. was very serious about it. And, but he also told me, gave me a trick, like I had this uh, substance. Uh, if the thing went too high, I could take and it would bring it immediately down or take a bit of lemon. I mean, he teach me tricks. But at the same time, he had founded the group Autonomous de Psychology Analytica, which is uh, this independent group of analytical psychology made up of all this uh, eminent young psychanalyst in Italy. Uh, and he was the president of it. I mean, he was still, even after he left the academic world, they still left him as president because they had very much respect for yeah, him. Yeah, he had a long-lasting impact on that. Yeah. Wim Meyer, uh, who, like I said, was Jung's, Carl Gustav Jung's disciple came to Rome and called my father in the middle of the 70s. My father said, no, I'm not going to have any more to do with this. I just don't want to have anything to do with it. So I, I remember my father talking about the abuse of uh, 
political, uh, the, 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 the political abuse of psychiatry. It was really something that made him uh, very sad. And he discussed it in front of my mother. So, I mean, these are things that I remember very vividly. Um, and, 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 and like I said, we had a very open relationship. My, I never hid any. I mean, my father was open about his consumption of drugs for experimental purpose. He did it only within an academic frame, but he was very open about it. Uh, what he was doing with his group of researchers and friends, because when he left the academic world, then he continued with these groups of people made up of academics, but also out of uh, artists, uh, uh, singers, and people like this, uh, quite famous people at times, that will come together with him to do these experiments. But like I said, they never had a coercive uh, nature. They were, more, they were more into the realm of uh, uh, the paranormal. Understood, yes. There's a lot of transparency, unlike our government here in America. Well, I mean, it wasn't. The, the problem is that then my father also had to be very careful because a couple of times he finished under the raiders of the Italian government who, who, who really got angry. And so we, we really, you know, suddenly, I remember one day we had like 50 policemen arriving at the house and, and my father was like accused of being the head of the Red Brigade. Oh, my. I mean, so, I mean, they were pretty serious. My father was the son, the, the, the son of, sen of a senator who had himself, a, my grandfather, a political history. So it was, uh, uh, let's say, uh, very, I mean, complex at times also uh, brought to some suffering. Uh, um, but in the end, I think that he understood the new mental battlefield. The, you see, in... Uh, in 1980, there was a publication, a uh, military review. Now, I don't know if you know this publication. Uh, it's uh, like um, a, a, a professional publication in which uh, Lieutenant Colonel at the time, he was Lieutenant Colonel, um, John B. Alexander uh, talked about psychotronics. And he started to describe the interaction of mind and matter. Um, this was very important for my father. This kind of research, uh, which actually also was going on in the Soviet Union, um, like the parapsychological research, they believe that uh, th there was the possibility of, uh, for example, remote viewing, the uh, that was very important. My father was very much into that kind of thing. So it's not about coercive things. It was about the reality of uh, paranormal events being accepted also by these people that could use them for military purposes. Um, and... Uh, and, and like I said, it's, 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 it's the extent of the parapsychological research in the United States is ultimately, at that point, at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, not really well known. But uh, there were scientific experimentation also conducted uh, within the, 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 let's say, many soldiers uh, had close calls with death in combat. And it kind of changed their consciousness. That was, for example, a very important thing. I myself had that experience. You see, the book of my father, Fumaster, which was the book they censored earlier, I told you about earlier, actually opens up with, uh, with me dying for a few minutes because we had this uh, spring in the, the garden, but two meter spring, like, a, how you say? So it was like, I fall there, I was like four years old. Oh. I was very, I was a child, I was uh, chasing the dogs, mm -hmm. playing with them. And suddenly my mother, from inside the house, which is far away, a few hundred meters far away, uh, she felt something. And it was like I had connected with her, with, uh, you know, telepathically. Yeah. 
and she started to run. And, and we were lucky enough that my mother actually had the uh, knowledge of, uh, you know, because I was upside down for a few minutes inside that water. And so I was actually chanotic. I was dead, basically. So they had to revive me, you know, and make all that. And my father, of course, was a doctor after I arrived. But uh, I was saved. But I remember very vividly the life-death experience of that moment when I exited my body upside down in that spring. So you saw yourself from another perspective, in other words. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that kind of experience yeah. brings out something different. And my father was more interested in that kind of, like, like I said. He was he, in a consciousness, in other words, study yes, of the consciousness. Yes. Yes. And instead, you had people uh, like... Uh, uh, like, like the, that monster of of of, of Cameron, the, the 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 guy who basically <laughs> inspired uh, even Robert Ludlum's uh, uh, books about Jason Bourne, because uh, that was uh, that Cameron was Donald Ewan Cameron uh, was an unscrupulous and evil psychiatrist. My father was never evil. Um, and that's why eventually, uh, ultimately, he left psychiatry altogether and he renounced it publicly in the middle of the 70s, which was a big thing for a guy like my father. I mean, we're not talking about because this was not any kind of psychiatrist. He had a bunch of VIPs who were coming and he was making a lot of money. And he was offered the direction of a clinic in Switzerland, which is the most, most prestigious clinic in the world of psychiatry in the world. So to renounce to all that because of your own ideals, it means that you have balls. And that's why I always, <laughs> uh, I always had, uh, um, of course, I wish that uh, he could see me now doing so well uh, with uh, this uh, book, because it is, of course, a lot of what we had uh, debated uh, and, and uh, together many times. And um, you see, he was... He was a psychiatrist, and psychiatrists have psychotherapy. Right. And so they... <laughs> I'm sure he's proud of you, though, Leo. Absolutely. No, absolutely. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm proud of myself of having put together something like this because I'm not a mental health professional in any way, and I don't present myself as a psychiatrist or as a psychologist. Uh, I had people from the, the mental health world, actually, who worked against me in the past because when the, um, in, nine, in 2000, my father was dead. In 2013, 14, I participated to the pitchfork uh, insurrection in Italy, as you remember, maybe, which uh, became very popular. You can find it on Wikipedia even, and you can read all about it. We, the whole of Italy was paralyzed by my initiative, my political initiative. But at that point, they punished me. They broke into my house. My wife was shocked by and traumatized by what they did. And it was a guy, Professor Giuseppe Nicolò, who presented himself in front of my lawyer as a member of the Tavistock Institute, who brought me in and kept me in a mental institute for two weeks. And I needed then three lawyers to get out of that mess. My goodness, yes. I recall you talking about that in one of your earliest interviews here. and. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty tragic. And uh, well, look at you now, Leo. You you escaped. You can't. You've come to America. Yes. You're uh, yes. quite successful here. Absolutely no, but also this. In fact, this book uh, has also a whole chapter on the Tavistock Institute because they could not be the experiments that took place from the fifties onwards uh, uh, here in America. If there wasn't not only the fear of what went on uh, in Nazi Germany or, and, or the Soviet Union, but also the inspiration that came from the Tavistock Clinic that was rebranded after the war, Tavistock Institute. Now, they were the ones who worked with people like Aldous Huxley. And I described the doors of perception as the gates of hell. Because, uh, you see, Huxley experimented and worked, uh, I mean, within a certain milieu of people that were very influential. I mean, you had H.G. Wells, 
uh, who basically coined the term New World Order. Bertrand Russell, the founder of analytic psychology, philosophy, if you want, or at least one of the main inspirators, and Adolf Huxley. And uh, they were promoting uh, uh, the use of psychedelic drugs. They were the ones that inspired the use of LSD and other drugs within the MK Ultra project. That's why Axie ended up living here, not in England anymore. Well, it's a good thing you're here, not in England, especially now, Leo. Absolutely. England is Ooh. a nightmare today. <laughs> uh, and, and, and every time I, I watch what's going on there, and I'm, I'm like shocked. But you see, I um, did a few uh, conferences and book presentations in the last two years before I left Europe in London. And what I saw there, because you see, I'm half English. I have part of my family in England. Uh, my aunt is a former judge. I mean, I'm well connected in England. Of course, my mother is a cousin to the, I mean, my grandfather was cousin to the Queen Mother. So, I mean, we are well connected in England. I could have chose to leave Italy and go to England because England, after all, is in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom is outside of the, of the EU. But what I saw in the last few months before I left here for America was that the United Kingdom was no better than the EU. There were already back then people who, like me, suffered injustice simply for a post on Facebook. You know how much they harassed me in Italy for posts on Facebook. I had to stop posting in Italian. The last oh, yes. I was there. Uh, in England, the same thing. I, I heard of people that, you know, the police was knocking on the, door, on the door in the early hours of the morning for a post on Facebook, just like they did with me. So, and actually with me, they actually broke the door for a post on Facebook. So it was even more extreme. But, 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 but I saw the only country left in the world where I could continue my mission was America. And the United States has still this beautiful constitution. And like I said, potentially, it even has a law to protect ourselves from mind control. It's only our ignorance that is permitting these criminals to continue with the rubbish. If, uh, of course, the deep state prevails, well, at that point, uh, then we will have uh, Kamala Harris for president. We will all be brainwashed left, right, and center. And anybody that goes outside of the conformity and compliance that is required will be punished. Absolutely. And as Leo... Not, we, you know, we are not yet at that point. We are not yet where Canada is. Not yet, but, I mean, we're getting closer every year, I think. I hope not. I hope uh, we can stop it. I hope uh, that uh, uh, we can stop it. Uh, you see... Um, in my book, I describe also um, some of the cultural uh, products of MK Ultra, the psychedelic era, no? And Timothy Leary said that basically the internet was the new LSD. Oh, I love that. Yes. Turn on, tune in, and drop out. And Leo, I believe this is a great part to uh, part ways, uh, matter of fact, that Leo, I, I do want to uh, thank you wholeheartedly for being on the program and sharing all this with with us this audience here and yes you can get the book confessions of an illuminati volume 11 and uh, go to and, amazon I mean, yeah, get this book because you will find also the connections between Ado Saxe, alistair crowley the abbey of telema used as a mind control camp you will find a lot of things that will make you rethink in your mind your own perception of of of, of what mind control uh, has been and how Close it is also uh, to the occult, and why so close to the occult uh, in many ways? Uh, because we had people like uh, Madame Blavatsky saying that hypnotism was uh, the, the most powerful form of black magic ever. Very so, nice, yes. Uh, and thank you for having me on, Michael. You got it, brother. Always an honor and pleasure. And that's leozagami.com.